So from April 3rd of 2000, our very first Black Hat to today, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we've changed. Today, Black Hat gives out scholarships uh, to people who don't have the resources to pay a full pass, but are still interested and passionate about security. And so they write white papers, they do some research, we review it, and if it's acceptable and we think the people have a desire to, to learn more, we give them a scholarship pass. So we gave out 103 scholarship passes to Black Hat. So if you have one, please raise your hand. Raise your hand, raise your hand. Right on, let's give them a round of applause. <clears throat> and we're really a friendly group. We like asking questions, we like being challenged. So if you see somebody that's a scholarship, um, just go up and say hi, introduce yourself, welcome them to the community, and hopefully we'll be working alongside them for years to come. Also, we have people here from over 83 different countries. So it's not just a regional show uh, in Southeast Asia. It's pretty much an international show with representatives from all over the world. And every year I kind of do this as a thing, but I have a list of people who are here, a uh, single representative from a country. So these are countries that only have one person uh, in attendance. So you're special if you're, you're the, the lone survivor from your country if you're, if you're here. Um, Albania, Algeria, Angola, Argenti Argentina, Azerbaijan, Bahamas, Brazil, Brunei, uh, Burkina Faso, Cambodia, Cameroon, Chile, Cyprus, Ethiopia, Isle of Man, Luxembourg, Macau, Montenegro, Norway, Papua New Guinea, Portugal, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Uganda, and one from the U.S. Virgin Islands. So welcome. Thank you for taking the time. <clears throat> Okay, so I have some opening remarks, and then we'll introduce um, our keynotes, and then we'll start the show. So I think there's, uh, uh, by a show of hands here, who here thinks that in the future, since we're forward-looking, show of hands, who thinks the future and the technology will be more complex than it is today? Who thinks it'll be the same or less complex in the future? Right, okay. Nobody raised their hands for less complex. Who thinks it will, the technology will become more fragile? By show of hands, more fragile. Less fragile. One, two, three, four. Okay, and who thinks the future is more automated? More decisions will be taken away from humans and they'll have to be automated. Okay, less automated or more humans in control. Okay, none. Okay, so, and finally, um, I guess I can use the word integrated or I can use the word dependent, but who thinks our future is more integrated or maybe more, we're more dependent on the technology? Right, less? Okay, well that's, that's our future, right? It's more fragile, it's more integrated, it's more complex, it's more automated. And how do you deal with this? And so generally, when you need rules around new things, whether it's telephones or rail, um, we look to governments for rules, we look to companies to self-regulate, or we look to a civil society to help show us the path. And I don't think it's gonna be any different in cyber. Um, and so, what will the rules of the road be? Well, we're going to be the people that are pretty much building the road. And other people, maybe governments or companies, will be telling us sort of like, don't move the road there, only build five lanes over here. But really, the decisions we're going to be making are going to be influencing um, this road. And you can see different governments have different approaches. And as time goes by, I'm more and more convinced that there's going to be two superpowers in cyberspace. It's going to be the United States, and it's going to be China. And I think there's other, there'll be a lot of other players. Europe will be very important, but I don't think they're going to be a superpower um, for a number of reasons. Um, and so if that's the case, and if you believe that internet problems are global problems, then that means that the two superpowers are going to have to work with each other to solve basic internet 
problems. Right? Where are the routers manufactured? China and America. Where are the phones manufactured? Right? The infrastructure is coming from essentially two places in the world. If there's a problem, it's going to have to get fixed in one of those two places. Um, and so I think we need to work where and when we can um, between the two superpowers, and everybody needs to acknowledge that while maybe you have Russia that's a great spoiler, I mean, nobody spoils like Russia. I mean, they can wreck a party <laughs> like you've never seen. They can come in and step all over your election or whatever. <laughs> but they're not building phones. When was the last time you bought a network switch from Russia? Never, right? And you're probably never going to buy a network gear from Russia. So they're a great spoiler, but they're not a superpower, right? And sometimes we treat them as if they are, and I don't think that's, that's distorting our view of how, how it works. Um, and finally, you know, how is cyber different? Well, we talk about cyber being the fifth domain. Right? There's air, land, sea, space, and then cyber. Um, and there was a big debate over this. And I think that I'll go along with cyber as being a fifth domain, but it's different. For example, if you are flying an airplane over my country and we're in a time of war, and I shoot down your airplane, the sky is still the sky. I sink your boat, the ocean is still the ocean, right? I blow up your tank, land is still the land. But if you attack my router, you attack my infrastructure, I'm going to change my access control rules. I'm going to update my software. I'm going to reroute my traffic. And then the network's different. Now the fifth domain just changed. And if we do this enough times, if you have enough conflict in cyberspace, cyberspace will change. It will be a different infrastructure. And then the question becomes, is that an internet we want to live with? What kind of internet are we leaving to our children? If we fight over the internet long enough, it might not be that desirable of a location. It's not that way in the other four domains. So. Finally, in Singapore, one of the interesting things is they also say it's all flat terrain. You know, in the four domains, you have high points, you have high ground, you have rules of the terrain. But in cyberspace, it's flat, it's digital, you're everywhere at once. But I would argue that's not true either. We're in Singapore. Why are we in Singapore? Singapore is not a superpower. But it has a superpower-like quality. It has the rule of law. And if you have the rule of law and you're predictable, guess what? Companies want to build infrastructure in your country. Where do you think the Amazon data centers, the Googleplexes, the Netflix data centers are going to be? They're going to be in Singapore because they have rule of law. So the rule of law will create a gravity which will draw in infrastructure, overseas cables data centers that will become so dense that, and hold so much information that you will not be able to move the data away and do compute on it and move the data back. The trend is you have to do the compute where the data is. The overseas fiber links are just not fast enough to move all these petabytes around, right? So there will be geography. Where are the data center? Where does the data lie? And so in this new world of geography of cyberspace, there are definitely going to be winners and losers. There's going to be people who can take advantage of it. And so we're going to be the people building those data centers, protecting those data centers, defending them. So um, I just want to leave you with a thought that future conflicts can permanently change our infrastructure and permanently change the type of world uh, we live in. So keep that in mind when you're hearing the keynote. So now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our sponsor, Infoblox, has been supporting Black Hat for years. Um, and I want to introduce uh, Chris Userman, who's the principal security architect for Infoblox. He spent over 30 years uh, in the US government uh, intelligence, on both sides, offense and defense, so he has a deep understanding um, of what goes on out there. And he's recently turned that attention into a defensive mindset to help companies and users protect themselves uh, from what's going on. So thank you very much.
my pleasure to introduce Chris. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Man, I love Singapore, by the way. This place is beautiful, especially when it was about four degrees Celsius in DC when I left. And in case you're wondering, I am about two meters tall. Uh, it, I get a lot of looks up. So, quick show of hands. How many are here because your boss told you that you're coming? Good, everybody's interested. One of the, one of the key points in that is, is, is disinterest, and that's really a big problem. Um, to give you a quick story, there's a building in San Francisco, and, and talking about uh, some of the limitations, the builders took some shortcuts. It's called the Millennium Building. It was built 10 years ago, and it has now, sh has now sunk into the ground uh, more than they ever expected to do over the lifetime of the building. And why? Because they didn't build it on a good, solid foundation. So we'll talk about that for a minute. So what if I were to tell you that there is a vendor category that can absolutely guarantee you defense against cyber attacks? Anybody interested? Nobody's interested in that? I'm not trying to sell you anything here. I don't even represent them. It's APC. All you have to do is flip the power switch. You don't have to worry about it. So what if I were to tell you that you could reduce 92% 90, of your vulnerabilities just by one action? Fire all of your employees. Neither one of those is realistic. So we have to really fight through all of the attacker activities that are coming into our networks, all of the noise, all of the, the challenges that, that we present uh, to ourselves and that they present to us. So with that, there's three foundational aspects that I really want to focus on, and that is having skilled people, having proven and flexible processes, processes that, that you can adopt, the things that you do today. So when you have an event in your environment, what do you do? What, how do you respond to that? Can you automate that? Can you build upon that? And then technologies that interact and communicate with each other. That's the single biggest complaint amongst most organizations that I help mature their cybersecurity programs is, is why can't vendors communicate? So getting to that point of being able to automate and orchestrate. But once you have that foundation, there are really three things that you need, and power of three, really three things that you need, and that is visibility into your network infrastructure, into your network environment. So network intelligence. You need threat visibility. And then you need a communicating ecosystem. And having all of that together can help really drive and mature your cybersecurity program. So on behalf of all of us vendors, welcome to Black Hat 2019. Thank you, and please come visit us next door uh, across the hall. And uh, I challenge you to bring, your, bring your, your challenges, your problems uh, to us and help us provide solutions to you. Uh, that's, the, that's the biggest single thing that we will provide value to each other. So with that, thank you. Okay, so now it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote, Miko Hyponen, to chief, well, who doesn't know Miko? Um, chief Research Officer at F-Secure, uh, located in Helsinki. He's been around, well, we've been around about forever, for a long, long time, decades and decades, and it's really fascinating to watch uh, your peers in the industry grow and development. And just recently, uh, Miko has joined the advisory board for the Monetary Authority here in Singapore. So he'll also be helping keep your money safe uh, if you live or bank in Singapore. So uh, he's going to talk a little bit about our future arms races, our, our current arms race, and how he sees these races playing out in the future, and how the decisions we make now are going to influence how those races are won or lost. So with that, I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Miko. Good morning, everybody. So my name is Mikko, and I used to be really, really worried about the Third World War. I was born in 1960s. I was a teenager in 
1970s and 1980s in the middle of the Cold War. And I really, truly was afraid that the next world war would become a reality, and that would be a nuclear war. When you were living in the middle of the, in the, middle of the uh, arms race of the nuclear kind, it was really hard to escape the fact that if in, indeed there would become a real conflict, it would very quickly become a world war, and it would be a nuclear world war. And I guess, well, I know that this has changed. We're no longer worried in our everyday lives about nuclear holocaust. Now, there are tens of thousands of nuclear warheads on this planet right now. They haven't gone away. We've been able to reduce the amount of nuclear warheads a little bit, but it is still a very much reality that nuclear weapons exist. However, we're not worried about a nuclear war like we used to be 20 years ago. Nuclear weapons are a perfect example of a weapon which was built on the power of deterrence. Nuclear weapons have been used in war two times in mankind's history. The rest of the power of nuclear weapons has for decades and decades been in deterrence, in knowing who has nuclear weapons and then not starting a conflict with those who have nuclear weapons because they have nuclear weapons. This is how deterrence works. And deterrence is changing. When we look at how conflicts play out today, they play out very differently. Because indeed, we have different domains for conflict, different domains for war. So I live in Helsinki, Finland, up there in, in Northern Europe. Finland has 1,300 kilometers of border with the biggest country on the planet, Russia. Both of my grandfathers fought the Russians in the Second World War. So we've always, I, we've always had this very concrete look into world geopolitics and how it matters. And I've been looking at conflict all my life. And when you look at the longer history, it's quite clear how technology is shaping conflict, how technology is shaping the wars we fight. If you look at the wars we, the mankind, used to fight thousands of years ago or hundreds of years ago when we didn't have the technology to do anything else except swords and the bow and arrow, the only kind of conflict we could have was land war. Then we got good enough technology so we could build warships, which means we got sea war. But the innovation of sea war did not take away land war. What happened was that conflict expanded. Now we had conflicts on both land and sea. And technology has done this over and over again. The innovation of fighter jets has created air war. Innovation of satellites and stuff has created space war. And now, today, cyberspace war. Five domains. That's where conflicts play out today. And when you look at current conflicts, they play out in all of these domains. A good example is the conflict going on right now between Russia and Ukraine. That's a remarkable conflict. It's the first war we have in continental Europe for decades. And that war is being fought right now on land, on sea, in air, in space, and in cyberspace, in all of these. But it's important to remember that this is not where it ends. There will be new domains. Right now, it's hard to imagine what could be the sixth, seventh, or eighth domain. But technology will continue to shape the domains where we fight our conflicts. Mankind is not going to stop fighting. We're good at fighting. We love fighting. We love wars. We keep forgetting the horrors of wars every couple of decades, every couple of, every couple of um, generations. Wars will be around for future generations to suffer from, and they will be fought in new domains. Right now, it's the five we know. And the arms race is now 
squarely in the cyberspace area. In fact, I believe we are in the very beginning of the cyber arms race. The previous arms race, nuclear arms race, that went on for 60 years. It's largely gone now. And it might, might very well be that we will be spending the next 60 years in cyber arms race. But let's think a little bit about what could be the next domains for war, next domains for conflict. Well, it's quite clear that robotics and drones are very much already a reality, whether they are flying drones or, or um, battlefield drones or even robots which can go around and shoot. However, today, basically all of these are still being controlled by humans. They don't select their targets on their own. They don't kill on their own. There's no technical reason why they couldn't do this already. There are ethical reasons. We don't like the idea that a machine selects who should be killed and who shouldn't be killed. But this is under an immense pressure. There are very big forces driving us towards a world where machines will kill on their own. When you think about battlefield drones, whether they fly or drive around, one of the biggest problems for the operators of these drones or robots is that they have to have a remote connection to these. Now, obviously the connection can be done through, through strong crypto, so there's no easy way for an outsider to hijack drones or robots like these, but it's fairly easy to disrupt the connection. We're speaking about radio connectivity, and you can just jam radio waves. Now, if your problem is that you want to operate drones or robots in a battle area, and your connections are jammed, how do you solve it? Well, you just get rid of the connection. You just program the machine to do its own decisions, which is effectively creating a killer robot. This is what's happening right now. There's plenty of technology which could do this already, and it might happen. And I think we shouldn't do this. But this domain, robotics, isn't really a whole new domain. It's just an extension of the existing domains. There are completely new domains for conflict, which we could see as the sixth and seventh domain for conflict. For example, DNA. How could a conflict or war play out when DNA warfare is at play? We don't really know. Just like we had no idea how cyber conflict could play out 30 years ago. We could guess, but we wouldn't really know. Or how about nanotechnology? I guess we could imagine a bomber flying over a battlefield, dropping millions of nanobots on top of foreign soldiers, which would enter their blood veins and do whatever. Sounds science fiction. Then again, so did cyber warfare sound science fiction a couple of decades ago. Or how about, well, artificial intelligence. Now, I'm very well aware how machine learning and AI are the current buzzwords right now. When you walk across the corridor and you go to the, the uh, hall where companies are talking about what they do, everybody's doing something with machine learning, which is absolutely true, because we're doing machine learning ourselves. It's very, very powerful. But then again, I remember reading about machine learning and artificial intelligence from magazines in the 1980s. Already in the 1980s, like almost 40 years ago, 35 years ago, something like that. This has been a long time coming. And we seem to have no easy way to define what we actually mean by artificial intelligence, especially with wide AI and general AI. How do we actually define this? But if there will be a moment in mankind's history where we will demote ourselves as the second most intelligent being on the planet, that's going to be a pretty big deal. In fact, it seems like a pretty basic evolutionary mistake to invite a superior intelligence into your own biosphere. But it, that could just happen during our lifetime. And we can only cross that line one time. 
The moment when we become the second most intelligent being on the planet can only happen one time, and we can't go back. So whenever, if, and whenever we're going to cross that line, we have to be very, very careful about how we cross the line. And what worries me in that is that it's a race. Because there's multiple companies which want to be the first to create real, true, wide, general AI. Google wants to be the first. IBM wants to be the first. Apple wants to be the first. Microsoft wants to be the first. And when you are in a race, what you don't do is stop and look around and make sure you're doing everything carefully. This is what worries me in the race to AI. But like I said, we have a very clear problem on, on definition. Like, what do we actually mean by this? In the magazines that I read in 1980s, they were speculating that one day we might have a computer which would be so smart it would be able to beat the best chess player on the planet. And if that's going to happen, well, then we have artificial intelligence. Well, that happened 20 years ago. And then we suddenly moved the goalpost. Then we like, all decided that, well, that's not artificial intelligence. It's just a, a very powerful calculator, but it's just a calculator. So what would be a way to define general AI that we all would agree that, yes, that would actually be really intelligent, just like we. Well, how about brain simulators? Simulators which are able to simulate every single neuron in the human brain, every single synapse in a human brain. And there are actually multiple projects underway right now which are trying to do exactly that. We are far, far away from being able to do that. But as computing power grows every year, it might just be doable one day. Initially, it's going to be very, very slow. And we were able to stimulate one single human brain in a massively large data center. It's going to be a million times slower than a real human. But as you know, computers get faster. Eventually, it's going to be as fast, then a million times faster than a real human. And this would be a real human brain, which would be just like us, without a body, which would have wishes and hopes and dreams, which would want to work, want to love, just like we do. And that would be, I think we would all agree that, well, that would be intelligent if it really would be able of, capable of doing a full-scale simulation. And if and when this happens, then we clearly will have completely new ways of solving problems, including solving conflicts and fighting, fighting wars. And don't take this from me. You can take this from Putin. Let me play you a clip. Whoever becomes the leader in artificial intelligence will become the ruler of the world, according to President Putin. And he might just be onto something right here. In fact, innovation in the space of general wide AI might actually generate more conflict. Like, imagine a situation where a country, or even more realistically, a company, is on the verge of generating real, wide, general AI. Well, the enemies of that country or enemies of that company will realize that if they succeed, if they are able to create something like that, it's going to be game over. Like, we can't fight with them anymore. We can't compete with them anymore. They are superior. We can't let them have that technology. We must steal that technology. Or if we can't steal it, we must destroy that technology. Is this what's going to happen next? We don't know, but it just might. And for us security people, machine learning is routine. It's an everyday occurrence. We know the value of data because we feed our machine learning systems with data. Data is the new money. We used to say that time is money. Today, data is money. But right now, in 2019, almost all of the work in security space 
done with machine learning and current AI systems, narrow AI systems, is defensive. I get this question a lot, especially from mainstream media. They're asking questions about attackers using machine learning and attackers using artificial intelligence to create attacks. And we aren't really seeing that yet. We have some really narrow cases, like we see poisoning of machine learning systems, including, for example, spam filters getting poisoned by, by attackers who understand how to teach them wrong by poisoning the data which is being fed to machine learning systems. But that's still pretty far away from seeing actual attacks which would be able to learn and change their behavior based on what kind of defenses they find. Attacks like that are doable, no question. We just aren't seeing them yet. We're seeing tons and tons of defensive work being done with machine learning. We aren't seeing attacks yet. Why? Well, my theory is that if you know how to program machine learning systems, if you know how to create artificial intelligence simulations, you won't have any trouble finding a well-paying job. You won't need to go into life of crime. But this isn't going to last forever, quite obviously. Today, if you want to deploy a machine learning system, let's say implement your own fork of TensorFlow and start building something on that, you have to be a computer science grad. In 10 years, less than that, in five years, we will have such an easy way of deploying machine learning systems that any idiot can use them. And then they will. And then we will start seeing real world attacks, cyber attacks, which will be deploying some kind of machine learning system, some kind of AI systems. Right now, the lack of skill protects us. It's not going to protect us for, for much longer. So that's an arms race as well. Now, I mentioned how deterrence has been the key for many of the traditional weapons. Nuclear weapons are the perfect example, but it also applies to basically any kind of traditional weaponry. Aircraft carriers, fighter jets, bombers, tanks. We know exactly how many tanks the Russians have. We know exactly how many aircraft carriers United States has. We know exactly how many fighter jets Singapore has. How do we know this? How do we know how many fighter jets Singapore has? Well, you just go and you Google for it. <laughs> we know the traditional power of weapons in, in every country because they show them. This is why we have military parades. You show your power hoping that that will create a credible defense in the eyes of your enemies so they won't come and attack you. You show your power. Well, how do you show your power in cyber? How do you show your superior capability in the world of cyber? How do you do a military parade for your cyber offensive skills? You don't. I call this the fog of the cyber war. Just like fog of war affects real conflict in real battle space, fog of cyber war is our lack of visibility into which countries and which militaries have what kind of capabilities. Like, like who's best in offensive use of cyber power? We, we don't really know. Well, we, we know who has most military capability in the real world. We know who, ha who has the nuclear warheads. We know who has more fighter jets than anyone else. When it goes to cyber, then we are looking at military budgets. We know United States has been spending more money in cyber over the last 20 years than any other country. So we can guess that the United States is very good. And we have some kind of visibility from operations where they've been caught and some visibility from leaks. We know Israel is very good with their offensive power. We know Russia is very active. We know China is probably the, one of the biggest players on the planet, and they're only growing stronger and stronger. And then we have Iran, then we have North Korea. In fact, today, every single 
technically advanced nation is building not just defense, but also offense. And we have no visibility. The fog of cyber war prevents us from seeing what exactly they are building. But they are building something. In some ways, cyber weapons are the perfect weapons. Cyber weapons get the job done. They are effective, they are affordable, and they are deniable. Effective, affordable, deniable. Effective, affordable, deniable. That's a pretty good combination of properties in a weapon. Gets the job done, isn't too expensive, and you can deny that it's not your weapon. There's very few weapons that have deniability. Cyber does have it. But they are not without their problems. You know, cyber weapons, just like real world weapons, rot. Cyber weapons rot away. Cyber weapons have an expiry date. Imagine building some kind of an offensive toolkit for military use. Well, it's going to employ some kind of an attack, typically some kind of an exploit targeting some kind of a vulnerability. Well, that vulnerability has to be in a system. Could be general purpose system like, I don't know, Windows, OS X, iOS. Could be an application like, I don't know, Chrome, Firefox, Adobe PDF Reader. Well, these systems change. The vendors who build these systems where the vulnerabilities are, are actively looking for vulnerabilities and they will patch them as soon as they find them. The systems themselves get overhauled. If you have the perfect weapon today, targeting unknown zero days in Windows 10, it's going to work today. Because Windows 10 is everywhere. In five years time, not that well. In 10 years time, it's not going to work anymore. It rots away. And this is problematic. When militaries invest large amounts of money to build offensive cyber capability and they get no return for their investment through deterrence and the weapon rots away, it only works for a couple of years, that almost automatically builds a scenario where it's more likely that those attacks will end up getting used so that there's at least some return on the investment put into all of these developments. No one knows you have these weapons. They're only going to work for a couple of years when they're reaching their life cycle, reaching the end of their lifetime. The temptation to use them becomes bigger. Of course, not to you know, start a war to use them, but for example, to give those weapons to intelligence people. That, hey, here's something you could use for your work. We had no opportunity to use it in a real conflict but you might be able to use it to steal information from our enemy. Cyber weapons rot. Just like real world weapons rot. Real world weapons have deterrence power, cyber weapons don't. Because of the fog of the cyber war. Now all this affects computers. I've been a computer security guy all my life. This is my 28th year working at F-Secure. 28th year working as a computer security guy. And all those years I've been thinking about myself as a computer security guy. I'm a computer security guy. My job is to secure computers. Laptops and desktops and servers, that's what I secure. Well, today, as you know, everything is becoming a computer. We are computer security people. Our job is no longer to secure computers. Our job is to secure the whole society because our societies run on computers. Everything is becoming a computer. Yes, it is the IoT revolution, which we all know and love and hate. But it's going to happen whether we like it or not. And this is not about smart devices. It's about stupid devices. Smart devices are already on the net. Consumers who buy smart devices understand that those devices are on the net. But very soon, as it becomes cheap enough, even stupid devices will go on the net. And the main reason why they will go on the net is to collect data, because data is money. 
So they will not go to the internet to give benefits to the consumer, they go to the internet to give benefits to the manufacturer. And this will apply to everything we will use in our homes, everything we will use in our offices, and I guess even more importantly, everything we will use in our infrastructure. And already today, when we look at the amount of botnets that we have analyzed at F-Secure Labs, we're seeing an ever-growing number of botnets which do not infect computers at all. Botnets which do not infect computers at all. They only infect security cameras and printers and coffee machines. But this revolution isn't new. It really started from industrial control systems and plant automation systems and companies like Siemens started building industrial control systems decades ago. This isn't new. Factories, power plants, food processing plants, any kind of industrial setting is being run by computers today. And every now and then we get reminders of what this actually means. Reminders of what it means when factories are being run by computers. We got a very good reminder last week as we saw the news about Norsk Hydro getting hit in their aluminium factories in Norway, in Qatar, and in Brazil, where employees coming to their workplace, coming to their factories, were met with notes on their doors about, please don't turn on your computer because we have locker goga going around the network. And when the news broke on last week's Monday, or actually Tuesday morning, about this particular incident, initially it, it looked really, really bad, especially because of the business this company is in. It's in the business of making aluminium. Aluminium manufacturing requires massive amounts of electricity. And if the manufacturing process is disrupted, it's very fragile. If your electrolysis pots cool down, you will end up with a lost factory. Factory that you can't fix, that you have to rebuild, basically. And that sounds like a pretty drastic thing. Well, this has happened. It actually happened earlier this month in Venezuela. Not because of a cyber attack. It happened in Venezuela because of extended power outages, because Venezuela has big problems with their infrastructure right now. But they actually put out an announcement earlier this month where they said that Venezuela, as a, as a country, has lost all capability to manufacture aluminium because of the power cuts they've experienced. And they estimate it's going to take at least a year to rebuild their capability. Now, as we learned more about the attack against North Hydro, we learned that it wasn't governmental, it was money-making, and we learned that they were able to continue operations. They didn't lose any factories. Why? Because of these guys. Because of old farts in the company who still knew how to operate the system manually. <laughs> Take a look at these binders. <laughs> these guys just earned their pension. The newcomers in the factory had no idea that you could actually run these plants without computers. Turns out you could. But how long can you? In 20 years, can we still do it? I don't think so. And the problem with infrastructure and plants is that the life cycle of the technology we put in these is really, really long. In some ways, this affects consumers as well. When we, as consumers, buy technology, we don't use it for very long. When you buy a new laptop, you use it for five years. When you buy a new smartphone, you use it for three years, something like that. But when you buy a piece of technology which has four wheels, when you buy a car, that's clearly technology. And you expect to be able to use it for years and years and decades. When you buy a new car, that car is still going to be on the road in 30 years, in 40 years, maybe even more. I'm driving a 19-year-old car right now, myself. So I asked my followers on Twitter what they thought about this. Like, how long do you think car companies should provide security patches for cars, and the consensus was that they should provide them for 25 years. Right now, nobody's providing patches for anything 
for anything like 25 years. Microsoft provided patches for Windows XP for 10 years, something like that. Are we able to do this? Are car companies able to do this? Cars have become data centers on four wheels. Now, I'm not saying they should provide security patches forever for free. This could be a business. I mean, you, you will buy new brake pads for your car and you pay money. You don't expect them to provide you for free working brakes forever for free. You will, you will pay for it. I guess people would be ready to pay for security patches as well, but somebody has to make them. What's the solution here? I don't know. It could be that car companies, when they reach the end of life for a particular vehicle, they will open source it and let someone else figure out the security patches and make a, maybe make a business out of that. We don't know. But everything is becoming a computer. Everything will need patches and updates. A friend of mine tweeted about how his car was receiving an over-the-air update while he was driving his Toyota. And I don't know if you saw the news earlier today, but earlier today Boeing announced that now they have a patch for 737 MAX 8. I wonder if that patch is going to be over the air. <laughs> so everything is becoming a computer. And this reminds me of the kinds of hypes we've seen around technology in the past which we have become to regret. It might be a bad idea to connect everything to the internet. It might be a bad idea to turn everything into a computer. Let me play you an ad. Smart woman, she's putting a new floor down by herself. Wise woman, she's using Kendile while as best as time. Easiest flooring to install, easiest flooring to care for. Save every way with Kendile while as best as time. Asbestos, what a great innovation. It might very well be that IoT is the IT asbestos. <laughs> Couple of decades in the future, we will look back to the mistakes we are doing right now as we converted everything into a computer and put everything on the internet. Just 15 years ago, the idea that we would be connecting our nation's infrastructure into public open internet would have been craziness. That's exactly what we are doing today. And we might eventually regret the things we are doing right now. So when we look at the different kinds of governmental attacks, it's about espionage or spying, or it's about sabotage and fighting wars. That's basically the options we have. The vast majority of governmental attacks are about spying and espionage. Now this is pretty obvious to see because spying is about collecting information. Information has become data. Traditionally, spies had to go where the information is. Today, you don't have to go anywhere. But we do see also sabotage and actual war fighting happening. And when you're trying to defend against governmental attacks, this is quite different from trying to defend against anything else. Most attackers out there are not governmental. Most attackers are criminals. Criminals are after money. If your organization is being targeted by a criminal attacker, you don't have to have too good security. You just have to have a little bit better security than the other potential victims. The attacker is not interested in you. They're interested in money. If it's too slow, too hard, too expensive to break into your network, they will find an easier target. They will go after the low-hanging fruit. And let me tell you, the internet is a garden of low-hanging fruit. <laughs> but when you're fighting a governmental attacker, things are different. They won't change their mind. They won't go after an easier target. Why? Because governmental attackers are typically part of a military organization. 
and they are following orders. They've been given an order. The order is go and break into that organization, steal that information, report back when you've done it. Go. So then when they are following the mission, and if they can't get in, they're not going to change their mind. Like, we can't get in. Let's go and break into some other random company. They're not going to do that. They will keep on trying until they get in. If they fail, they'll try again and again for weeks, months, years. If they can't get in any other way, they will eventually have one of their own employees recruited inside the organization they're trying to breach. This is a hard problem to solve. So almost all governmental attacks are either espionage or spying or sabotage or waging war, with one exception. And that exception is North Korea. North Korea is the only country on the planet which is so bankrupt that they're willing to do attacks to steal money. Like how bankrupt do you have to be where you resort to ransom Trojans to fix your budget deficit? But that's what they're doing. And not just ransom Trojans, we've seen plenty of attacks targeting, of all things, Bitcoin exchanges in different countries to steal cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are anonymous. They're great for criminals. They're also great for bankrupt countries like North Korea. And when you look at this a little bit deeper, you realize it actually makes a lot of sense because the amount of money being controlled by some of these hacked cryptocurrency exchanges is significant. It's surprisingly large. And it's already anonymized. It's already untrackable. It's already in the shape that the attackers need it. This Bitstamp exchange from Slovenia is a great example. Their annual trading volume was 35 billion euros. To put that into perspective, 35 billion euros is 100 times more than what the Slovenian stock exchange is trading every year. This is one Bitcoin exchange, which is basically a startup. So these targets are very easy compared to traditional targets, which would have the same amount of money. And governmental attackers love supply chains. If they can gain access to supply chains, they know they can gain access to where they want to be. This is why there's so much headlines about supply chain attacks. Last time we saw headlines was this week. We believe that the same gang which was involved with the attacks we saw this week might have been involved with the sea cleaner attack which we saw two years ago, another supply chain attack. In fact, there's been a surprisingly large amount of governmental attacks against supply chains based in Taiwan. Can't really explain why, but there's plenty of governmental operations from different governments that have targeted supply chain in Taiwan. Even Stuxnet. Stuxnet, created by USA and Israel, the binaries were signed with legitimate certificates stolen from two companies in Taiwan. Why? We don't really know. So how do you fight? We speak about APTs. And the key letter in advanced persistent threats is P, persistence. When you have a persistent attacker, an attacker who won't give up, how, how do you resist? How do you fight? Well, there are ways of fighting by using the attacker's methods against themselves. For example, reputation-based mechanisms, which don't rely on knowing anything about the attacks. Simply look at how common certain things are. For example, when attackers create completely unique new binaries, new attack files, hoping to evade detection, we can actually use that to detect, to, to detect them. Like how, how likely it is that uh, an end user inside of your organization is going to execute a program and he or she is the first person on the planet to run that program. Not very likely. And when an attacker is creating unique Trojans or backdoors, that's exactly what they're doing. 
We can use that to detect them by reputation. Or when you look at sensor-based technologies, attackers for decades have been building attacks where they first download all the defense tools and test whether their attack is being blocked before they deploy their attacks. Well, when you build sensor-based technologies to block attacks, the only place where the attackers can test their attacks is in the client's network. And when they test there, we can see it happening. And this is what we should be doing. We should be thinking about ways to counteract the mechanisms the attackers are using. There's no point in trying to play catch up. We can't defend against all possible attacks because we have limited imagination. Attackers will be able to imagine an attack that you can't. So if you build your defenses like a fortress, you build walls around your network, you try to keep everybody out all the time, that's going to fail. And this is what we have been telling our clients and customers for 20 years. Just build strong enough walls, put firewalls and proxies and filters around your network. Nobody, nobody's going to get in. But what if they get in anyway? And they will. The larger your network, the more likely it is they will. So we should assume that the defenses will fail. And nobody likes to do that. Nobody likes to assume that all the investment they've put around the perimeter is going to fail. But that's exactly what we should fail, because that changes the mindset from trying to defend at the perimeter to looking at what's happening inside the network. Which means you will be able to detect the breaches faster, which means you will be able to respond to the breaches faster. And that's exactly what we should be doing, and that's exactly where most companies are failing the most. We know, because we run incident response teams. Those are the teams which get the phone call when a company gets hacked. And those calls are almost always done in panic. Oh my God, we've just been hacked. Could you come right now? And we go there right now. And we take a look at their network. And we tell them that, yes, you're right. You are hacked. But you were hacked last year. <laughs> There's no rush here. We'll come back next year. So we are in the middle of an arms race. The domains we have today are not going to be the domains of the future. We are in an arms race, and everything is becoming a computer. And if you think yourself as a computer security person, it's time to ex expand our minds. We're not expanding the security of our computers. We should be protecting the security of our societies. Thank you very much.